Hi, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. I want to talk to you just very briefly about some of the very fundamental principles of filter design and a little tiny bit about IR filters. This is not going to be a bunch of detail. You really need, if you're interested in this topic, to go further. You really need to work through a, a book or take it on a course, a real course on digital filter design. But I thought, you know, since we're going to be using filters quite a bit in what we do, it would be worth mentioning at least a few of the basic ideas and principles. So, uh, I hope everybody's well out there, and let's go ahead and get started. So, it turns out the easiest way to make a low-pass filter. We talked last time about the fact that if you have low-pass filters, you can kind of get the other kinds. And so we're going to concentrate today on the design of low-pass filters. And the easiest way to get an FIR low-pass filter is to use a transfer function that essentially takes a window of past samples and then rounds off the edges so that some symmetric thing is the actual transfer function of the filter. And if you do that, it turns out you'll get a filter with quite a lot of latency, but also if you use enough taps, if your convolution is big enough, you can get a fairly nice shape for that filter. There's a ton of window functions out there. Uh, it seems like sometimes when you look at the literature, the whole field of digital signal processing for a long time was sort of obsessed with the idea of finding a better window. And there's a lot of windows with different properties. You know, the, the obvious things to look at, like triangular windows are kind of boring, um, but they are easy to implement. Uh, you know, things like Blackman, Hamming, hand windows, those kinds of things are sort of more DSP motivated, but maybe a little fancier to calculate the window function. But basically we're gonna convolve some function that's a symmetric function that goes near zero at the edges to with the signal, and that's gonna give us an output of our filter. Uh, and you know, we've already seen this because we noticed that we have to, because DFTs treat the signal as circular, we need to normally round off the edges of a DFT anyway. So we have to apply some kind of windowing function. These are the same windowing functions. There's nothing new or magical here. We just have some windowing functions that we're gonna have to apply to things to make it work. And that's great. So we go ahead and force the period to be the period of the DFT by applying a window to the signal. But you'll notice that by what we just said, this is also a low pass filter and low pass filters change the signal. So we really are gonna be in a situation where we're gonna be filtering whether we want to or not away high frequencies and that's the thing for better or worse. Now the biggest problem with the windowing filters is that they aren't really very principled. You sort of can take the image of the window under itself under the FFT to get some idea of how it's gonna shape the frequency. But what we really want is to sort of pick the coefficients so that we get the best shape for what it is we're trying to do. It turns out there's an optimization optimization procedure called Parks-McClellan or Remez Exchange, which actually lets you do in a principled way state space search in the space of possible filter amplitudes to try to find a filter with high accuracy for a given number of coefficients. So I tell you how many coefficients we're gonna use, I tell you what it is we're trying to do, and the Remez exchange process is an optimization process that tries to adjust all the coefficients to produce the right filter shape. Uh, the basic idea has to do with something called Chebyshev polynomials. The filter is gonna be uh, treated as coefficient, co the coefficients of our filter that we're gonna convolve with are gonna be treated as coefficients of a Chebyshev polynomial. And then it has to do with max, minimizing the maximum error. So it's gonna be a classic minimax trick where you find the place where your filter is the most off from what you wanted and you adjust coefficients to fix that even if it makes other places a little worse. Uh, implementing this is hard. Um, it's sort of very hard to implement it yourself. But fortunately there's library routines. So for example, uh, SciPy has a library routine that you can feed it 
a specification of what filter you want and ask it to do the parts McClellan Remez exchange thing and it will produce a minimal minimax optimal filter or tell you that it's finding it too hard and it can't meet your specification which is one of the possible outcomes so that's you know if you're looking for efficient filters that's one good way to do it with FIR but a better way sometimes to get an efficient filter if the performance is hurting you is to go to infinite impulse response filters and we talked about that last time a little bit, this idea that we feed the filter's output back into the filter and treat it like history. And for some reason, it turns out that's really a useful operation, that if you can recycle your computation in producing filter outputs, that can be a really useful input to the filters. And that's strange, but it's just take it as a true thing, because it is. And it's real common that you can very dramatically reduce the size of the convolutions you need to do. You can take a 12th order IIR filter, a 12th pole IIR filter, one with 12 coefficients, and replace one that's sort of 1024 pole in the FIR domain. That's, you know, that factor of 100 ish kind of reduction is the kind of thing that makes you really excited to use IIR filters instead. The big, there's two problems with using IR filters for things. And the biggest one is that really the, the techniques for doing filter design in the IIR space, it isn't like FIR where everything's fairly straightforward. You really have to be pretty comfortable with complex analysis and you're going to play around with moving poles and zeros in the complex plane around and you're going to play around with you know quotient functions and it gets really gross really super fast. Um, the good news is that the people who do this kind of stuff have spent a long time thinking, especially since these filters are really nice for the analog space where you want to keep your component down, count down, thinking about this. And they have standard sort of filter designs with known properties that you can just borrow from and use without really having to understand exactly why they work. Um, and really, once you've got a fil the filter coefficients for the output and the input, it's the same computation you had before. This didn't wrap very well, but um, let's look again. The so we take the you know the inputs and multiply them by the input coefficient. We take the past outputs and multiply them in reverse order by the past output coefficients, and then we just average again to get the amplitude right, just like we did before. And all of a sudden, lo and behold, here's my output in FIR. So the computation's the same in some sense. Uh, you're going to get some delay because you can't compute the I, I th output until you've computed a bunch of the other outputs as well as a bunch of the inputs. But in general, you know, you're always going to have delay in this situation. Um, the biggest problem with this is that with the FIR filters, sort of all the inputs are between minus one and one, all the coefficients are typically between minus one and one. And so the terms don't grow very big or very small very fast. And so you really can use fairly cheap representations and be pretty happy that you're gonna get the output to be right. Here, if you're not really careful about how you do this computation, those past outputs can be large the things can feed back into themselves in funny ways and you can end up with a situation where you overflow your arithmetic really super easily or underflow your arithmetic to zero really super easily um so it's very numerically sensitive strongly suggest you use floating point numbers for this and even that won't always save you but it will make it better and really you know the second thing like i said before is you know figuring it out yourself you can go look up a filter structure and use it with a known filter type. And if you sort of follow enough instructions off the internet or out of a book or wherever, it's really likely you can get good filters out of this. And it's sometimes worth it because these filters are so efficient. There's so much more to be said about filter design and filter application. It really is its own whole course in a double E program. Uh, but um, I'm going to stop here and we're going to, Take this as enough to at least get started. And like I say, those of you who are interested in these topics, I'd really encourage you to pursue them further. There's some really fascinating stuff there. Hope this was useful. Like I said before, I hope you're all doing well out there. It's been great to talk to you, and I hope to talk to you again soon.